Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Can everyone hear me? Here we go. <clears throat> so, uh, ooh, here we go. So I wanted to welcome everyone to State of the Spark, uh, where we ignite lives of explosive significance. Spark citizens like you are out there helping other people. And, you know, this thing's got us doing all kinds of things to make sure that we're staying connected. And so today I'm just reaching out. We've got uh, the State of the Spark, and a quick update is State of the Spark is here. We're still in business. The Spark Bookkeeping is out there doing great. State of the uh, Spark Sites has been on fire, helping people digitize their business. And I'm doing as much as I can to connect with small business owners to help them stay afloat. So this is just another avenue to communicate with. So thanks for being here. Uh, so I, I promised everyone in the title that uh, today is all about having an apology. I've got an apology. Uh, today is also about uh, welcoming everybody to Stay the Spark and to the show, so we covered that. And the third thing is uh, applied psychology, and I want to share you from a little bit of one of the things I'm reading that I think is really standing out, and uh, we'll wrap it and send you guys off for your day. So my first thing that I promised is an apology. So uh, you got to make sure that, especially as you are in such close proximity to people as we are right now during corona and even before this in office spaces or wherever you're at, um, being okay with apologizing. And yesterday I promised Lisa Resigliano, Batgirl Lisa. Uh, I promised Lisa I'd give her a call back. We were gonna work through some marketing for her. So Lisa, if you're watching, I am sorry. I will reach out today as best I can. Uh, as you know, we're kind of slammed right now, but our clients, and Lisa's been one of our clients longer than, geez, just about anyone. Lisa, if you're watching, I think you've been a client with ours for like four or five years, believe it or not, but we've been connected and friends through some of the Lakeland business groups and stuff. So that's my apology for this morning. You caught it. Grant apologized for something. And, uh, and so I'm sorry, Lisa, and we'll get to you. Uh, I also wanted to offer a quick piece of gratitude. So I, I'm a big fan of gratitude. I don't know about y'all, but I love gratitude. It's empowering. I feel my energy go up. I feel that my life opens up and I feel like optionality fun word of the day. I feel like optionality opens up when you're grateful. So I want to share this piece of gratitude about this person who has absolutely been doing a fantastic job. I consider close friends what are foxhole friends. These are people that I know that when the crap hits the fan, I can turn to them and they're cool, they're calm, collected, they have perspective, they're thinking clearly, and they're delivering. They're delivering. I've noticed a good handful of my friends that I thought were Foxhole friends that we had good relationships when the market was fine and business was fine and their business was fine. I noticed that they freaked out. They lost their cool. They started throwing stones at glass houses, you know, because, you know, everyone's taking sides in the coronavirus. But pick a thing, pick the war in Afghanistan or the market correction in 2008. Everyone starts to pick a side and gets divisive and gets nasty. Foxhole friends, or what I consider spark citizens, are people that step up to the plate in the midst of these times and just deliver and they stay consistent. And honestly, I think I heard Brian Tracy say recently that leadership only exists in crisis. When things aren't in crisis, leadership is otherwise known as management. Now we could debate semantics, right? We could talk about uh, how leadership can happen in times of peace. But true, pure leadership is needed and necessary during times of crisis. That's what I consider my Foxhole friends. Adam Welchel deserves hats off right now. So Adam Welchel and Brittany Welchel together have tag teamed so much. And if you know these guys, you already know what I'm talking about. But Adam and Brittany and I partnered on Spark Bookkeeping, oh man, two years ago now. And Adam, you know, he touches a lot of things. If you know Adam, he's passionate about a lot of things. And, you know, he came to me almost as a coaching client way back in the day. And then we became acquaintances and then friends. And then we did uh, book readings together. And then he and Brittany got married and they started a family and became investors. And Adam has just grown into 
a highly respectable man. And when he came to me, I want to say it was two years ago now, um, and said, hey, I want to do this bookkeeping thing, and I want to do it under the Spark brand. I was A, touched, but B, I was like, let's do this. In the last year and a half, two years, Adam has made himself a top-notch bookkeeper. And when the shit hit the fan on coronavirus, and then the, the bill came out, the CARES Act came out, Adam has been on the front lines, on the back lines, onboard, onboarding new employees. His cash flow has gone up personally, but he has been over delivering on so many ends. So if you know Adam, if you know him on Facebook, if you know him virtually, or if you know him in real time, I want you to reach out to Adam and pat him on the back. I want you to tell him he's doing a phenomenal job because we here at Spark Nation, at Spark headquarters uh, on Hartzell here, we absolutely have the utmost respect. So my gratitude today is for being partnered with people like Adam and Brittany Welchel who have delivered and are still delivering. He was up last night at 10 or 11 going through the CARES Act, just determining if you could get this $10,000 or this hundred grand or how to move your money, what banks to go to. He's out there doing it. He's built a business that allows him to figure things out while he has a team supporting him. He is just a wholehearted person. So anyways, I'll get off the Adam Welchel train, but State of the Spark today is recognizing Adam Welchel. So thank you, Adam, for everything you're doing. So real quick, you're at home now. Uh, one of the first things Marissa did uh, when she realized that we might be in this thing for the long haul is she said, Grant, I want to I wanna get the, the Witcher series. We watched The Witcher on Netflix. And I'm sure some of you guys watch that, but she, uh, she loves to read. And when she really needs to unwind, like me, Marissa loves a good novel. And so we went and picked up the Witcher series. But if you know anything about me, you know that, in fact, I just mentioned with Adam, one of the first things that we fellowshipped over was a book study. Rob Boudreau is a good friend. One of the first things we fellowshipped over was a book study. I think Gina was there. I think Debbie Huffstedler was there. We had a lot of great people. Uh, Natalie Kale was there. We had a lot of great people at that book study. You know I love to read. You know I love to read because books saved my life. Hear me on that. Books saved my life. When I was, in my, when I was young, I went through severe depression. And uh, you know, at one point, my little brother and I uh, were just having to take care of ourselves. And I read him the Bible, stories from a kid's Bible, and that reading saved my life. One time we were traveling in the summer, and uh, at the time, I just was not into going outdoors. I am now. I love camping. I love hiking, thanks to my dad. But my dad took us on a trip to camping outside, and I was just having a miserable time. And somehow, either he or someone in the family got me the Lord of the Rings, the original novels, novels, and it was phenomenal. It changed my life. And so that's a lot of fiction. And I developed a passion for reading on fiction. So fiction is powerful. If your kids are reading fiction, do not chide them. Let them read fiction. Well, I went through severe depression as I was leaving my teens, moving into my 20s, having to take care of myself and realizing I wasn't prepared for anything. So I started reading. Someone handed me Think and Grow Rich. And, oh, it's not on this shelf right here. They handed me Think and Grow Rich. And I've read that book to the nub. I've got this other book that's been a powerful one. This was a gift for me. This particular version of this book was a gift for me from my friend James Joseph, As a Man Thinketh, phenomenal book. It's in the same category as Think and Grow Rich. But my reading, let me show you what I'm reading, and then I want to give you a specific small excerpt. Check this out. So State of the Spark, for those who don't know, State of the Spark, it, you know, we're non-location nation, and, our, and we ignite lives of explosive significance. And our goal is to basically launch you into your passion so you're living a more meaningful life. That's what we mean when we say igniting lives of explosive significance. And uh, we build freedom frameworks. So we have like a freedom framework for businesses, MSPBA. It's a really easy way to understand your business and how to alter your business. Um, another freedom framework, we have the emergency protocol, which we'll be rolling out to everyone um, on a critical quarter because this quarter is going to be critical for a lot of people. So we're rolling out the emergency response five-step freedom framework for everybody as well. There's fitness freedom frameworks. So here's the thing. We have a, a one macro freedom framework called the TLE. That's the total life experience. And the Spark Citizens, the people who are in the Goals and Gratitude Facebook group, check it out if you haven't yet. We, we talk about things in terms of the TLE, and the TLE is the total life experience, and that's fitness and health, that's healthy, happy relationships, that's work we enjoy or have fun at, and that's spirituality. So I've, I've framed my reading around that. So this is my normal morning reading. This is my normal morning reading. And so right now, what I'm reading is, uh, this sounds so silly. This is how to eat. This is for fitness and health. Um, this is written by Thich Nhat Hanh, which is one of my favorite Buddhist writers. 
And um, it's a small book. You can read it in one sitting, but I don't. I make this a meditation. So this is a fitness and health meditation for me. And this also counts as my spirituality reading because the way he's written this, it is about cooking and how to eat mindfully, how to not rush through your food. I've got one good friend who I used to live with. And if he's watching or sees this, he knows who I'm talking about. He just, he eats it was speed eating. I lived with another good friend who's a name in, uh, in Lakeland or Winter Haven who knows who I'm talking about. And he used to eat like he was a prisoner, man. This guy would eat like he was in jail just I don't know, before anyone <laughs> could uh, to get his food. And there was no reason for it. It was just how we eat. And I eat sometimes very mindlessly. This book, How to Eat by Thich Nhat Hanh, is very meditative on how to treat your eating spaces. So I read a little section of that every morning. So that's fitness and health. Healthy, happy relationships, quite often when it comes to relationships or techniques, uh, specifically I'm thinking of Tony Robbins' neuro-linguistic programming techniques, we often think those are about manipulating other people. But if you know anything about neuro-linguistic programming, that's all about actually maintaining your own habits, maintaining your own mindset. I read Tony Robbins' Awaken the Giant Within. This is the second or third time I've read this. And right now, and it's a pretty, it's a pretty meaty book, right? I'm reading this right now to govern myself because I'm trying to be better in my relationships. Right now, I'm trying to be better in my business relationships as I'm working more and more closely with Brandon and Christina as a team. I'm working more and more with my wife who uh, is trying to get onto the Pacific Crest Trail and now we're in a house together for 30 days. I'm trying to be better. So in terms of healthy, happy relationships, I'm reading Awaken the Giant Within and it's all about governing your own mental state. So that's what I'm working on there. And last but not least, and this is a kind of odd one. This is a trippy one. This is psychology applied, and I want to zoom in and show you guys this cover. I love this, and I picked up this book, or I forget where I got this book, but I picked it up again because I saw a, a psychology applied, and I saw Crane, and it, I was like, man, this is a really old book. It looks mid-century modern. If you look at the date, this was a textbook from the 50s, 1952, 1952. You can see that there, but I love this because I used to nerd out about Batman, and the scarecrow was a behavioral psychologist who lost his mind and his name was Dr. Crane. So, and then of course, this is applied psychology and I just said it out loud and I'm reminded, we also watched Frasier. If you've watched Frasier at all, you're gonna see psychology and Dr. Crane and you're gonna be like, I'm listening. <laughs> uh, you've reached Dr. Crane and I'm listening. If you've ever watched a show, you nerd out, it was like the 80s and 90s, fantastic show. And I just saw, uh, uh, the same actor, his name is escaping me, but I just saw him on an old Star Trek Next Generation episode. Applied Psychology, I picked this book up because I wanna also be better at relationships. This is my work I enjoy book. And this is really odd. I have books on web design, I have books on sales, I have Screw It, Let's Do It by Richard Branson, I've read all that, but I was looking for something more tactical for marketing. And I actually, in a different context, I picked this up because of what I was telling you about the, the column. And I opened this up and I realized applied psychology was a textbook for marketing. And I wanted to read just one sentence, one sentence for you that I just came through. The, the chapter is the opening, opening chapter to this book. And it's talking about the three, uh, the three degrees of motivation in people. And there's first degree motivation. So if you are salivating for sugar, like you're, you're hungry, right? And you're salivating for sugar, actually giving you the actual physical sugar, putting it on your mouth is what's known as first degree motivation. If I have it right here and I want to barter with you about that, you'll barter with me because I can hand it to you. So instant gratification was being talked about in the 50s. Second degree motivation is uh, – second degree, yeah, motivation for um, – uh, consumers or people is when I'm on a show like this or we're on TV and I do a little commercial and I, you know, I do a jingle for Cocoa Puffs and you see this jingle in the box of Cocoa Puffs it bumps around and you start salivating and you think, mm, I want that thing. That is based on a first degree motivator. I need sugar, at least in that moment. And then you're programmed over time through all the marketing manipulations out there that when you see the second degree motivation, a box of Cocoa Puffs or whatever your cereal of choice is, that's a second degree motivator. A third degree motivator is something you get to get something to get something else. And this sentence is where this comes from. And this was actually stirring to me, especially today. And it's this. It is apparent that money may frequently 
be only a third degree stimulus unto the subject. Now hear that. Money is frequently third degree. People don't really want money. I was mentored by this millionaire real estate guy, Scott Parker. And uh, I remember him telling me once, Grant, you want cash? Take all the cash out of my pocket. Take it. It's irrelevant. I don't want cash. I want access. You know, they often say that uh, uh, time is the currency of the wealthy. And I've heard that, and I believe that we could debate that, again, semantics. But I've also heard that access is the currency of the wealthy from my millionaire mentors, from my investor mentors. They're often looking for access. Money just gives you access, access to the things you want. In this market, y'all are often, most of America is on a stay-at-home order. Most of the world, India, is on a stay-at-home order. And the first concern is the economy. That's my first concern for my clients. Like, I know what happened in 2008. You, if you've been around, you know what happened in 2008. Depression set in. Things got ugly. In the, two, in the 2000 or 1999 stock um, uh, internet uh, bubble that popped, and then after we went to war in 2001, you know what happens when the economy tanks. We think about our money and we're like, oh my gosh, our money. But I want you to realize the concern isn't in, in today's environment. I want you to, to know that there's the stimulus bill and that's only going to get us so far, I think. It's going to take ingenuity. It's going to take entrepreneurship. It's going to take some, some grit. But it is, on the other hand, only in our case, 30 days. So in the state of Florida, they might extend it, but it's only 30 days. But we get concerned about money. And I'm here to tell you it's not about the money. Because I think what we all are actually concerned about is access. When we're asked to stay home, I know I get mega frustrated when I can't be at my local coffee shop. So is it about me having money to go run around and buy coffee? No, it's about access. Is it about access to coffee? No, it's not about access to coffee. So each of us, the rich or the poor, thinks in terms of access. What can I get access to? I've been poor. I've been on the street at least twice in my life, once as an adult. It was about access. Could I get a shower so that I could get clean? So did I have access to a shower? So if I ever went homeless again, I'd live in my car and I'd put any money I had into a gym membership at Planet Fitness. Why? Well, so I could work out, but really so I could shower. Why? so that I could then have access to job applications. We don't, we are worried about the money, but I want you to pause for a second and get reflective and realize you're worried about access. And if you can think about that, then I want you to think about what it is you need access to. In my example, when they told us to stay at home or when they shut down restaurants, I said, I know what people are saying, but I'm still gonna go to the coffee shop. And Marissa said, why? I said, I like, I like going for coffee. And she said, well, but why? And I had to think about it. And for me, when I've been dirt poor, uh, both, well, the one time as an adult that I went dirt poor, the only money I had left was money for a cup of coffee. And at that cup of, co cup of coffee, I sat at a coffee shop. And if you've read my book, The Top 100 Dream Igniter, you've seen this. But it's the last money I had. I sat down, I drank a cup of coffee, and I pondered my life. And in that moment, I had a sudden epiphany about all of the reading I had ever done as an adult, all of the practice I had ever done as an adult, all of the work I've done here, all of the journaling, all of the fitness, all of the focus, all of the missionary work in Haiti, all of the sleeping in a tent, all of the minimalism experiments, they have all been to shine in times of crisis, not when it's abundant. Hear this, all the practice you do to be a better human is to be better in times of crisis. And if you are not being better in times of crisis, you need to check what you've been practicing and revise it. So I say that, let's back up. It's not about the money. For me, it was sitting down for a cup of coffee. And at that coffee where I had an epiphany in 2008, I had a sudden epiphany and then I met someone who radically changed my life in one minute. It was about people. So as we are being asked to be cordoned into our homes or self-quarantined to help the world, I get it. I feel constricted on lack of access and not just lack of access, but here's the next step. So if the first step is we think it's money, but it's not. The next step of logic is we think it's access and it is access, but it's access to something else. And I think for not just me, but for everybody, it's access to connection. 
I connected with somebody I needed who made a massive difference in my life at that time. And that person changed me. They became a friend of mine. They passed away and left a mark on my life. I've got their book right here that they've written. Sheila Hollowell is his widow, and she's still out there living her life. Connection. Coffee. Me having money allows me to go out and get coffee, allow, have access to coffee, allows me to connect with people that matter. But here's the thing I want to encourage you for, the extroverts out there and introverts alike. If you have a self-quarantine order, I hear it. Let's respect the law. We could argue pros or cons, where it came from. We could debate on that on another show. But I'm here to tell you, you can connect today. The thing we have today that we didn't have in 2008, the thing we have today that we didn't have in 2001 is the technology to connect anywhere at any time and in a meaningful way. Is it the same thing, Grant? Not at all. Of course, it's not the same thing. Of course, it's not the same thing. But it's something, and how richer will your connections be once we get out of self-quarantine and we've defeated or overcome this uh, uh, challenge that we're having societally? So I want to encourage you. Again, I got that from my reading. That was from what I'm reading, Psychology Applied. I'm giving you a peek into how I read. When I read something, I think about its meaning, and I hope you do the same if you're reading nonfiction. It's not about the money. Money is a third-degree motivator. People really want something else, and for me, it was access to coffee, but money means something else to you. Maybe it's travel. Maybe it's freedom. Maybe it's sitting on the patio. Whatever. Maybe it's not worrying in times of crisis. Maybe that's all it is, but that's second degree. That's a second degree motivator. I, I encourage you to explore in journal today what your first degree motivator is. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your future. Maybe it's just selfishly you want to go surf and maybe you want to tan. Maybe you want to work on your fitness. Whatever that is, I want you to continuously discover. Vishen uh, Lakiani from Mind Valley calls this means goals versus ends goals, but you can also apply it to marketing. So we can talk in another episode about how that might apply to marketing. I want to thank you for stopping by. I'm going to check out of here. It's about 6.30 in the morning. You've got places to be. I got places to be. I want to thank you for stopping in on the State of the Spark. I'm having a blast out here. Uh, I am looking for ways to connect with people to support small business. If you need help, let us know. Holler at us at stateofthespark.com. Uh, if you have any questions about what to do about your business, let us know. We've got a coaching product that's pay as you want, sneak peek. There's a pay what you can uh, coaching product coming out very soon. Uh, check in with Adam Welch if you need clarity about what to do with the SBA loan, with Spark Bookkeeping. They've done a phenomenal job. You can find them on Facebook and in the interwebs. Thank you so much. Have a, an extraordinary day. And here's to you igniting your own life of explosive significance. Thanks. Have a great day.